One mother's terrifying ordeal at the hands of burglars. The only thing I really said for the first five minutes was, don't hurt my daughter. Tonight, detectives need your help to find those responsible to stop them from striking again. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. Tonight our studio is packed full of detectives from across Britain. They're waiting to hear from you. And it's thanks to you that we've had some fantastic results last month. Half of our most wanted faces are now in custody and we've had two arrests from our reconstructions. Your calls make a difference. They do help solve major crimes. So can you help find the killer of this human rights campaigner? He just, he looked asleep but you knew that if you tried to rouse him or whatever, you knew that there was nothing you could do. That, that was it. And, Rav, who do you want putting away tonight? Well, you did such a great job last month. Let's see how you get on with tonight's bunch. Plus, do you know these two cowboys who broke into news agents? And, Matthew, what have you got for us? Well, this woman, Dina Thompson, spent 20 years manipulating men by spinning a web of lies before finally going in for the kill. He was very depressed. Bad stomach upset. He changed. He was having problems at work. He had a very hot curry. He changed he had aspirin. aspirin. And then he was taking my antidepressants. Detectives finally put Dina behind bars. I've got the inside story of how police caught the Black Widow. But first tonight, we need your help with what I have to tell you really is a very vicious robbery. It happened in the small Cumbrian village of Langwaspy to a young family just about to celebrate Christmas. Please do watch closely. These thugs need to be caught tonight. There isn't a day that goes by where you don't think of it. Well, I found our love. Because <laughs> it's memories as well. <laughs> just dried, just a pure dried. <laughs> This is the quiet, tranquil village of Langwathby near Penrith. Not the sort of place you'd expect to attract the attention of a highly organised, violent gang, capable of subjecting a mother and her 18-month-old daughter to a terrifying ordeal. But that's exactly what happened here last December. Langwathby, typical sleepy Lake District village, you know. Um, I think there's about 350 people live here. People are nice and friendly. It's lovely for children, very peaceful. The last 18 months has been very hectic, really. We've moved, we've done the house up, we got married last year, I had a little girl. We're all looking forward to her enjoying Christmas, really. Well, it was a Friday before Christmas, and all of a sudden, Friday, for the guys work in my house and a few of my pals, we always have a drink in the next village. Heavy present. Oh! I'm off out now, love. Have fun. Don't See you later. Bye. 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 Clever girl. I bathed her and started to put her to bed just after 7 o'clock. I was quite tired, so I actually thought that I'd probably just watch a little bit of telly and go to bed myself. I went to check on my daughter. thinking I've got to get the door shut, I've got to get the door shut. I just didn't know what was ahead of me.
The only thing I really said for the first five minutes was, don't hurt my daughter, don't hurt my daughter. He can do anything you have to do to me, but don't hurt my daughter. Please, 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 please. Don't Where's the rest daughter. of the watches? I don't know. I'm going to ask you one more time. I'm going to kick your head in. They threatened to smash my head in. I don't know where they are. Where are you? <laughs> I just thought, I've got no chance. I can't do any more. And I saw the door open onto the landing and I just thought that I had nothing to lose. I saw the bleach, I thought actually they were going to put it in my eyes. This is a lesson. I can just remember begging them not to put any near my daughter, but they didn't care. Shut up! In just 20 minutes, Lindsay had been tied up, punched, kicked, and had her arm broken in a sustained and vicious assault. But this wasn't a random attack. We believe the gang had been watching them for some time. At 4.30, when we're gonna pop up to the pub, and I saw a black pickup truck. So I didn't think too much of it at first, but I had a shower and I came out, and it was still sat there. And then all of a sudden, the pickup truck moved off, and it, after, like, it must have been there at least 15 minutes. I didn't think too much about it, you know. There's lots of nosy people in any village. That afternoon, a similar vehicle was seen on a number of occasions around the area, close to the house. But this might not have been their first visit to the village. Oh, hello. Can I help you at all? We're looking for Paul Beard. He's supposed to have a workshop here at 7. 7? It's 7.30 now, but you should be able to find him down there. He just lives down there. All right, thanks, mate. OK. Thanks. OK. We are looking for a ruthless criminal gang who are not afraid to use extreme violence against defenceless victims. We know they've done it before and that they'll do it again. But next time, who knows how far they'll go? It might have just been a 20-minute job for them, but obviously it's affected the rest of your life. I'm quite scared. I don't really like my own company anymore. <laughs> I'm not as confident as I was. You never ever think it's going to happen to you, but when it happens, it's probably... Uh... Uh, it's the worst thing. You just the worst thing you could ever think of. To think that there's people out there that can do these sorts of things to anyone's disgusting, but to put a child through it, I just really think that they're just vicious, horrible people. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? I'm joined now by Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Ashton of Cambria Police. You're here with your team. We're hoping to get a result on this tonight. This was horrific for Lindsay and, of course, as any mum will know, made intensely a lot worse by the fact that she was trying to protect Lexi. Absolutely, Kirsty. This was a, a terrifying ordeal for her, carried out by a ruthless armed gang. They were clearly intent at doing what they had to do that night yeah. and going to stop at nothing. And, and that was outlined by the fact they involved a, t uh, a young child and sustained Lindsay to a vicious assault and breaking her arm. Very clear from, from what you said in the reconstruction there that they were being targeted, they could have been watched for, for a fair Absolutely, amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. We believe they've been watched for some time. Uh, the robbers had a, a fairly detailed knowledge of the house and, and uh, details of the family. We're very keen on a black Toyota Hilux Invincible right. that was seen 
uh, in and around the time of the offence, containing anywhere between three men whenever it was seen. So if you've seen that vehicle on the day of the offence and the, the occupants, please get in touch. Yeah, quite a distinctive car. Mm -hmm. um, we should say they got away with a fair deal of money and also very distinctive pieces of jewellery. Yes, Three pieces, very. take us through. Yes, the first piece is a wedding band. It's engraved with the initials uh, FB, JB and LB. Very distinctive. The second piece is a diamond-encrusted uh, ring. Uh, really, again, a very distinctive piece uh, of, of jewellery that um, somebody, if they were offered that, would certainly recognise. And the third piece is a diamond-encrusted ladies' uh, oyster Rolex watch. Again, very distinctive. If somebody's been offered these pieces of jewellery, please come forward. You know, they hold the key to this. These guys thought they were being smart with the bleach and trying to get rid yes, of DNA. Yes. Actually, they did leave behind clues. Tell us about the clues they left. Yes, um, they've left some trainer marks behind, and we know that those trainer marks belong to an Adidas trainer and a Nike Air Max trainer. Although they were balaclavered up, Lindsay got a really good look at them close up. And her description of the first one is a man with a, a Liverpudlian accent, about six foot tall, slim build, dark brown eyes, um, uh, aged between sort of late 30s, early 40s. The second one is an East European accent, paler skinned and described as having pale blue eyes, heavier build and taller than the uh, first one. Now, uh, it took place on the 18th of December, but you think that these guys may have visited the village before? Absolutely, yeah. We have a sighting of three men at the Brief Encounter Cafe at uh, Langwathby Rail Station. One of, the, one of those had a Liverpoolian accent, one had an East European accent, and they were asking about the birds, where they lived, you know, and questions like that. Really suspicious. We are keen to speak to anybody that was either at the cafe that night that we haven't seen already. We have seen a number of people, or those people, if they're not involved, come forward, we can eliminate them. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, wind up for now, Jeff. Thank you uh, very much for that. Let's hope we can stop them. What a vicious bunch they are. There is a big reward, I should tell you 20 grand for information leading to an arrest and a conviction. So please, before these guys strike again, and they will. Pick up the phone now, 0500 600 600. You could call the independent charity, Crime Stoppers, anonymously. Their number, if you're interested, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. If you want to see the reconstruction again, it's online, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. For now, though, here's Rav with the first of tonight's Most Wanted. Right, we had a fantastic response to last month's Most Wanted, and as a direct result of your calls, half have now been arrested, like this bloke, Lee Zhang. He was wanted for people trafficking, running brothels and money laundering. And thanks to you, Zhang was tracked down to a house in South London and he's now behind bars, serving a four-year sentence. So let's do just as well with tonight's bunch. And first up, we've got this guy, Fidar Utmanzai, and he needs to be found fast after escaping last month from a psychiatric hospital in Edmonton, North London, where he'd been detained indefinitely for manslaughter. 20-year-old Utmanzai was last spotted on CCTV on Wandsworth High Street. He speaks very little English and he's extremely dangerous, so if you see him, steer clear and just call police immediately. Number two here is Amrullah Hafizi, and he's wanted for the violent rape of a young woman in Liverpool last summer. Hafizi says he's 19, but could be older. Don't worry, though, he's easy to spot, as he's missing a toe on his left foot. Next here is Raymond Fitzgerald, and he's wanted for fleecing hundreds of people for fake concert tickets, pocketing over a quarter of a million quid. Fitzgerald also uses the names Hyde and Harris, and has strong links to Hastings in Sussex. And my number four here is Robert Moore, and the list of things police want to speak to him about is pretty long and includes attempted murder, robbery and a stabbing. Moore's 24 years old and has links to Merseyside. So, do you know where Moore or any of the others are hiding tonight? Pick up the phone now if you do. 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space and then your message. And it's really important to leave that space or your message won't get through. And you can also check these mugshots out online. bbc.co.uk forward slash crimewatch. And remember, all of our most wanted stay on the website until they're caught. Now, to the murder last month of human rights lawyer Abdel Salam Hassan Abdel Salam, a man who dedicated his life to helping victims of torture, but he was killed in his flat in London. Emergency Amnes, tell me exactly what's happened. It's the man downstairs, doors open, blood everywhere, and he's lying on the floor, and there's blood, Lay and he's not blood. moving. My father was found in his flat in the hallway by a neighbour. The door was ajar. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning. He'd been stabbed a number of times, but the, the blow that killed him was the one to his leg, and he bled to death. 
can't see it, I can't believe it. And to die in that violent way. He was a very uh, special uh, person. He was uh, at once uh, a very knowledgeable and intellectual man, but also very uh, jovial. So he was, uh, he was very engaging uh, in, in the way he would uh, talk uh, to me about uh, Sudan, his work on human rights, and also what, uh, what mattered to him, and that was to, to stand up for justice. As a father, he was really understanding um, he was really calm, he was quite sensitive and um, just really loving. Why someone can do such a thing for someone who is so peaceful, who is so dedicated to, to fight for the right of people who are vulnerable, who are unfairly treated. It was a complete shock to me. I, I couldn't believe it. So I, I started calling other people just to find out more whether it was true or not. Uh, and uh, it took a, a long time for this reality to sink in. Before I saw his body, I was hanging on to the hope that it wasn't him, it was someone else. And he just, he looked asleep, but what was really sad about it was that you, you knew that it didn't matter if you tried, if, if you had been in there with him, if you tried to rouse him or whatever, you knew that there was nothing you could do. That, that was it. Sometimes I'm thinking, if I knew who did it, I would just say one thing to him, that you just killed someone who have been fighting against what you did all his life. Well, joining me now is Detective Inspector Graham Gwynn from the Metropolitan Police. Thanks for joining us, uh, Graham. Uh, let's start with the facts. Tell us what you know for certain. All we know for certain is that Abdul Salam was found at his home address in Boone Street in Lewisham on the morning of Saturday, the 13th of March this year. That was about 10 past 7 in the morning. He'd received a number of stab wounds to his body, to his head, to his torso and the fatal wound was to his lower leg where he, uh, he died that uh, day. We know that uh, the previous evening he made, made phone calls to uh, some friends so we know, know between Friday the 12th and on Saturday the 13th he died. And who is it that you're appealing to tonight then? People that you're specifically talking to here? We're looking at a general appeal to appeal for witnesses to come forward. We do know that Abdul Salam did have injuries to his hands. He had cuts to his hands which indicates he did defend himself and so there was some sort of struggle. So we want to speak to anyone who saw or heard anything or heard that struggle. We also want to speak to anyone who saw Abdul Salam or spoke to Abdul Salam on that Friday the 12th of March and asked him to come forward with information. And, and what about a motive here? Because as we know, as we heard from his friends and family, this was a guy who dedicated his yes. life to doing the right thing, to seeking justice did, on behalf yes. of, of other people. Why would anyone want to murder him? There is, there is, as you say, there is no clear, obvious motive. We are keeping an open investigative mind with regards to why it's happened. But what we do know is there was no property taken from the premises. And also, it is clear to us that, as you say, he was a well-respected, well-liked person who spent his life helping people. So we would encourage people now to come forward and give us some information. Um, his former wife and his daughter there, we saw them I mean, very as composed as they could be yeah. and incredibly dignified, but definitely entirely devastated by what's happened. Yes, as you say, and as anyone watching that film would see, that they are completely devastated by what's happened. He has a number of friends and colleagues who are also devastated by what happened. And, of course, the people he helped throughout his life, he is no longer there to help them. So we would encourage people to please come forward and help us now. Uh, Graham, briefly, there is a reward being offered here? Yes, there is. The Metropolitan Police are offering a £20,000 reward for anyone with any information to come, for, to come and help us to try and find, catch the killers who caught... Who, killed Abdul Salam. Indeed, thanks very much for joining us. If you've got any information, no matter how minor it might seem to you, it could just be crucial. Call us right now. 0500 600 600. For now though, it's over to Rav to see who's been caught on camera. First, remember this. It's CCTV of a young man being assaulted in London. The victim is smacked so hard he nearly falls under the wheels of this bus before being repeatedly punched and kicked as he lies helplessly 
on the pavement. Well, as a direct result of your calls, these two were identified as the attackers. They're James Byrne and Alex Dallinder. They both pleaded guilty to ABH, which is actual bodily harm, and have been sentenced and ordered to pay the victim compensation. So great stuff. Let's make sure we do just as well tonight. We're in Greenfield, North Wales, back in January. Hello, what's going on here? A couple of lads are broken into this news agents and are smashing their way into the cigarette cabinets. Uh, it's a bit late for that. We've already seen your ugly mug. They get to work clearing the shelves of thousands of pounds worth of goods. Cheers, mate. Now we can see you even better. They thought it was the perfect crime after disabling the CCTV. Only luckily for us, they didn't. Know them, shop them. This man is on the lookout for a victim in Chelsea, West London, last May. After a quick recce, he waits with an accomplice in this stolen Peugeot. They spot a young family across the road, cover up and pounce. They try to nick the ring off this woman's finger, dragging her to the ground. It's only when her husband bravely intervenes that they give up and make their escape. This was a premeditated, violent robbery in broad daylight. They didn't get their hands on anything this time. Don't give them a second chance. Who are they? Think back to last December. It's 10 in the morning at this bank in Bradford. And this bloke wants to get his hands on someone else's money. He boldly approaches the counter and holds up a suspicious looking blue package. Then he tells staff, it's a bomb. He demands cash, but luckily, a quick-thinking member of staff raises the alarm and our brazen bomber flees empty-handed. Time for us to blow his cover. Name, please. We're outside Club Afrique in Canning Town, East London, in January. A fight has kicked off and things are about to turn very nasty. This lad wants revenge and will stop at nothing. He runs off, but soon returns. He's changed his clothes, and this time, he's armed. He goes up to this man in the light-coloured jacket, pulls out a gun, and opens fire. At first, the victim doesn't realise he's been hit. Then he falls to the ground. Amazingly, he survived. Our man is carrying a weapon and isn't afraid to use it make the streets safer and name him tonight. If you know any of them, let us know. Call us right now on 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime, space and then your, then your message. And if you need a second look, go online, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. In just a moment, the elderly woman murdered in her North Wales home. Was it a burglary that went wrong? <laughs> Why would they want to kill my mother? She'd done nothing to anybody. Why would anybody want to kill her? And can you identify the men in this car who smashed into a shop in Bradford and stole £100,000 worth of gold jewellery? Now, 16 years ago, a widow in North Wales, Doreen Morris, was murdered in her home. It looked like a bungled burglary. No one has ever been caught. Her family needs to know what happened. She'd done nothing to anybody. Why would anybody want to kill her? It was beyond belief that somebody had killed my mother. There's a gap there. She's not there. Oh, my mother really had uh, the most dreadful start to her life. She was so neglected as a child, the authorities took her away from her mother. She spent her early years in her home, and when she left, um, she went to work in a very large house on the Anglesey as a, a maid, and that's where she met my dad. My dad was delivering eggs there. Well, she got married when she was 21, and she had David, and me afterwards, 
and then Audrey, and Andrew is the youngest. Um, my mum and dad owned a 50-acre dairy farm, which they both worked on, worked on very hard. My father died in 1990. He had emphysema, diagnosed as farmer's lung. Mum was devastated, totally, totally devastated. Her best friend had gone, and she had looked after him for a long time. But she continued. She continued with her garden, took her dogs for a walk. She used to say she used to feel like the queen when she used to walk her corgis. She loved walking the corgis. Four years later, a murder investigation was launched following the discovery of Doreen's burnt skeletal remains in her bungalow. To this date, nobody has been convicted of her murder. On the 24th of March, 1994, Doreen had spent the day in Hollyhead looking at caravans with her friend Jackie. Come on in, I'll make you a nice cup of tea. Thank you, Edward. I think we deserve it after that. There we are, put the kettle on. Oh, oh I know. What did you think of the caravan? Well, I liked it. Jackie left at about 5 p.m. We know from neighbours and her family that Doreen usually went to bed at about 9 p.m. This night was no different. She separated her corgis, one sleeping at the foot of her bed with her. Past midnight, Doreen's neighbour heard one of the corgis barking. When he looked outside, he saw a light was on in the bungalow. It went off about two minutes later. Who, who are you? Who are you? Shut up! Why, why Shut you? up! Get out! Get out! Get out of my house! You're not going to take my house! What do you think you're doing? Get Due to the amount of blood found inside the bungalow, I believe that Doreen was subjected to a very violent assault. After killing Doreen, those responsible then set fire to her house, possibly in an attempt to destroy any forensic evidence. Send somebody quick, there's, there's a fire, a fire next door, there's a woman in the house. It looks like the, the roof's caving in. The offenders made off with a TV, hi-fi and jewellery before dumping the electrical items further down the lane. I was the officer in charge of the first fire engine uh, that morning, and when we arrived at the scene, the, the, the property was well alight and well engulfed in, in flames. And, after a, a, a few hours of fighting the fire, I, I just come across uh, basically a torso, really. Um, what was sort of, uh, you know, unrecognisable, uh, looked like skeletal remains to me. The fire was so intense, it destroyed the bungalow. Doreen's charred remains were found lying next to the corgi Meg. A blood-stained fork was found under her body. I believe this was the murder weapon. Everything that Doreen had went up in smoke. So was this a burglary that went wrong? By cutting the phone lines, they ensured that Doreen was unable to call for help. Did she recognize the intruders? Why, why Shut up! Get out! Is that why they left her for dead and destroyed her bungalow and all that was in it? There are people in Hollyhead who continue to keep this dark secret. Now is the time to come forward and finally bring justice and closure for Doreen and her family. They murdered her violently, set a house on fire, and they're now getting on with their lives. And they have no rights to that. While we live with that knowledge every single day. My parents were hard-working people. They believed in fair play, Huarateg. That's what we want here. Fair play for my mother, justice for my mother. That's why it matters. 
It matters. DCI Hansen is uh, with me now, John. We heard there from Audrey and Helen, I mean, for the family so horrific that their mother, who was so dear to them, ended her life in this way. Yes, Kirsty, it's absolutely deplorable. Um, it's bad enough being burgled, but for those responsible, why did they feel the need to kill her? And when Doreen's body was discovered amongst the remains of the bungalow, she was burnt beyond physical recognition, and she was only later identified through dental records. Do you think that she was targeted? Well, you will see from the aerial photograph that Doreen's bungalow was at a fairly remote location in Hollyhead, and it's not the sort of place that you would stumble across in the middle of the night, so it's something that we can't rule out. And, of course, it wasn't just uh, Mrs Morris, it wasn't just Doreen that, that died in this attack. No, one of Doreen's pet corgi dogs, Megan, was trapped inside the bungalow and couldn't get out and she burnt to death. Right, let's get right down to the nitty-gritty of this. You think somebody locally has got significant information here? Yes, I do, Kirsty. I believe there are people in Hollyhead who know exactly what happened on that night and I would really urge those people to contact me and please speak to me so we can take this investigation forward. Yeah, 16 years on, this is the time to do it and we should tell those people that there is a significant reward in play here. That's right. There is a £100,000 reward for information which will lead to the arrest and conviction of an offender for this crime. And I would add, Kirsty, that there is also in place established mechanisms for protecting witnesses and supporting them. OK. For now, John, thanks very much. £100,000, that would make a huge difference to somebody's life, maybe your life. For full details, have a look on our website. Somebody knows who these people are. If you're the person, if you've got any information, I would urge you to call us now, 0500 600 600, or you could call the independent charity, Crime Stoppers, you can do that anonymously, that's fine. I'll give you their number, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. If you want to take another look at the reconstruction, just to be sure of the details, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch is where to go. Now here's Rav and Matthew with great results in the cases that you've helped us with. The phones were red hot last month and we've already had developments on two of the reconstructions that we featured. First, we showed the case of a horrific sexual assault of a schoolgirl by a stranger in her own home. Well, following our appeal, a 36-year-old man was charged with multiple sexual offences against children in both Warwickshire and Northamptonshire. Daniel Lishman has now pleaded guilty to five sexual assaults and will be sentenced next month. Fantastic news. Well, we were also joined by Dutch police who, along with the Metropolitan Police, were appealing for information on the brutal murders of two young women whose remains were dumped in city centre canals. What's that? Nothing in there. Nothing it's probably money. Nothing money. There's going to be a million there. We're rich. We're rich. Oh! <laughs> Police are investigating the discovery by young children of human body parts in the Regent's Canal in North London. Eleven years earlier, the dismembered body of a young woman was pulled out of the Westersinger Canal in Rotterdam. For the first time, we have joined forces with our Dutch colleagues to investigate the killings. Together, we need your help to solve the chilling mystery as to why two young women's lives were so cruelly cut short. Well, a 53-year-old man has now been charged with the two murders. We'll be keeping a close eye on both cases. Next, the latest on a case that has gripped the nation for the last eight years. The hunt for the killer of 13-year-old Millie Dowler. Yeah. 
Six months after she vanished, Millie's remains were discovered in Woodland in Hampshire, 30 miles away from where she was last seen. Well, earlier this month, detectives charged 41-year-old Levi Belfield with Millie's abduction and the murder and the attempted kidnap of 12-year-old Rachel Cowes in the same year. We'll keep you updated. Finally, four years ago, we showed you this CCTV of a 50-year-old businessman, Charlie Butler, being fatally shot outside his own home. The gunman opens fire, shooting Charlie in the neck. He spent eight months in a coma and then died. Well, two people watching that night immediately recognised the gunman as this man, Douglas Johnson. He's now been convicted of Charlie's murder along with another man, David Austin, and both have been sentenced to life. More proof that your call can make all the difference. An armed robbery now. More than £100,000 worth of gold jewellery snatched from a family-run jewellery shop in Bradford. It was a particularly bold attack and it's left the family feeling very vulnerable. Let's do this. Two minutes in and out. sped across the junction of Maidstone Street and LePage Street, striking the jeweller's window in broad daylight. The gunman had come for just one thing, gold. two minutes, the gang had stolen over £100,000 worth of gold and made off in the Golf GTI. It was now a race against time to flee the crime scene. Immediately after the raid, the golf was seen turning into Midland Road. That's the last sighting of the gang. Within 20 minutes, they dumped the vehicle just a few miles from the jewellers. Did all four leave the burning car or had some got out earlier? It was late morning. Somebody must have seen them. They were carrying bags, guns and lots of gold. My wife, my mum, they keep telling me to get out of this business, do something else. They, they're scared. Even my children are scared. And it's affected my dad a lot. Never goes out of the, my mind, you know. I try, I try to, I mean, get rid of this, you know. But it never comes out, you know. It never comes out, you know. Always frightened, always frightened. I don't feel safe anywhere, not at home, not here. When I even come set off from home, I even look outside and see if anyone's following me. Please help and try to catch, let them catch. Because if you don't do that, might be sometime happen with you, same thing. You know. This could happen to your son, to your family, to your home, anytime. They could have killed. 
The whole family so badly affected by this one. Joined now by D.I. Ian Brower. You saw him there in our reconstruction. You're now uh, certain, and you and your team, that it could be up to £150,000 worth of jewellery that's been stolen here. And you're also pretty certain that people in the wider community are going to know about this. Yes. This raid was well planned and well executed. I believe that this gang have been watching the jeweller's shop over the days or weeks prior to the robbery taking place. Did anyone see anything suspicious during that time? Um, you, I mean, we, we know you've got great CCTV because we used it there in the reconstruction. And in the CCTV, they left some clues, these guys. They did. One of the robbers is wearing a black hooded top with a distinctive white motif on the front. Does anybody know anybody who has a jumper like that? Um, you're also trying to track down the, the, uh, these bags here. There were laundry yeah. bags that were used. Quite new, these laundry bags. Yes, we do know from the CCTV that the robbers used laundry bags identical to this one to take the jewellery away from the scene. We know that these bags can be bought locally. Did somebody buy a quantity of these bags either days before or even on the morning of the robbery itself? Um, let's talk about the number plates on the getaway car. You, you yeah. don't have those. You need to track those down. I do. We do know that the Black Golf GTI was stolen in a burglary a month prior to the robbery. Right. And I do know that shortly after it being stolen, number plates were changed. And the number plates that the car was then showing, or now showing, was MJ55YBT. I do know that when that car was left at Bullride Avenue and set on fire, the number plates were removed. I need to know where those number plates are. That could be crucial, that one. Um, there's a reward? There is. The family are clearly distressed about this robbery and have put forward a £5,000 reward for uh, anybody who was convicted of this robbery. OK, thanks very much, uh, Ian. Um, if you've got any information, do phone us right now, 0500. 600 600 or if you want to call the independent charity crime stoppers anonymously do that i'll give you their number here it is 0800 treble five treble one so we're to rav now and our second lot of most wanted faces right my number five here is a sex offender dean barnes he's wanted for failing to comply with the conditions of his release after doing a runner two years ago he has links to merseyside lancashire and london and has previously worked as a market trader Six here is Adrian Punau, wanted for the attempted murder of a man last September. The victim was at home with his heavily pregnant wife and teenage daughter when they were shot at. They were lucky to escape Punau's connections to Sheffield, Nottingham and Manchester. But he is violent, so keep away if you see him and just call police immediately. Next here is Stephen Devalder, wanted for a violent robbery in Colne, Lancashire. He was charged but failed to attend court and hasn't been seen since. Devalder's originally from Manchester and also has links to Spain. And last but by no means least is Christopher O'Brien. and He's been on the run for two years after being arrested for importing illegal weapons into the UK. O'Brien has links to Harrow in North London, Liverpool and Thailand. So come on, where are they tonight? Don't wait. Call us here in the studio 0500 600 600 or you can text us on 63399. Just type crime space and then your message. Don't forget to leave that space or your message won't get through. And we have more wanted faces on our website. We can also sign up for regular updates and that's bbc.co.uk forward slash crime watch. Thanks, Rav. Now, here's a tale of one woman, Dina Thompson, who spent 20 years targeting men and fabricating the most fantastic lies to get their hands, to get her hands on their cash. And when that wasn't enough, she turned to murder. I should tell you, it's a shocking story. Matthew takes it up, how the police caught the Black Widow. Dina Thompson is every man's worst nightmare. For almost 20 years, she used sex and deception to extort thousands of pounds from a string of lovers. But her most powerful weapon was murder. I once called Dina the Black Widow because a Black Widow spider will mate with his male counterpart and then kill them. This is the story of fatal attraction, how one woman spun a web of lies to manipulate men before going in for the kill. Dina and Richard had been married for eight months. He was in love and trusted her with his life. It was New Year's Day. Started the morning off by having a bath. Got a surprise for you. Dina said, do you mind if we play a little game? Get out of the bath. <laughs> You've been adventurous, darling. Mm. She tied my hands behind my back. She put some tape around my ankles. 
and then she placed a towel over my face. Are you ready for your surprise now? I could hear rustling sounds coming from the bedroom. Something in me said, there's something maybe not quite right here. It was at that point I freed my hands. Had I not freed my hands at that moment, I would not be talking to you now. The next thing I knew was the most searing pain I can ever remember. I can still hear the sound of that bat ringing. All I can see is red. The will to survive really does kick in. Forget this was the person I was married to. I was gonna die as far as I was concerned, unless I did something very drastic. It was at that point I put my fingers in her eyes as her most vulnerable point. <laughs> something then gave and she broke down and she said, it's all been a lie. Richard had met Dina 15 months earlier through a Lonely Hearts column. He was instantly smitten, but to her, it was just a game. With her prey hooked, she would use a series of well-practiced ploys to reel him in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> First, there was flattery. Dina had to show incredible interest in everything you did. I love to see fishing. It was just a breath of fresh air from previous relationships. We got married on a beach in Florida. Then came lies about her wealth. Dina told me that approximately six months previously, she'd won the lottery. £300,000? It's in a high interest account. Next, Dina invented a serious illness. I've got breast cancer. I think it might be terminal. I quit my job and cashed in a £30,000 pension to enable a better quality of life for Dina. Finally came the fantasy of a new life abroad. Why don't we move to Florida? You could be a fishing captain. Her <laughs> skill was homing in on people's hopes and ambitions, and those hopes and ambitions can make you a bit blind to what's actually happening. Immediately after the attack, Dina packed her bags and left. That night, Richard, too stunned to tell anyone, lay silent. But the next day would reveal the extraordinary extent of her lies when an estate agent knocked at the door. Hi, can I speak with Mrs Thompson? Why, what do you want? Oh, I'm here to sell the house. I'm an estate agent. I was, I was told you're in, you're in Florida. Oh, I'm sorry, I think you made a mistake. I suddenly realised what Dina's plans were. To kill me, sell the house, no one was going to be looking for me because everyone thought I was going to be in Florida. And then she could live happily ever after on the proceeds of the sale of the house. It was at that point I decided to call the police. For some local officers, there were unnerving similarities between the attack on Richard and a previous case they'd come across. I thought this, this can't be happening again. It really rang alarm bells in my head and everybody else's that was involved in it. Six years earlier, a man by the name of Julian Webb was found dead at his home in suspicious circumstances. It was the day after his 31st birthday. Julian's wife said he'd been depressed for days before taking a lethal dose of antidepressants. But the grieving widow was Dina Thompson. Julian was an advertising rep for a local newspaper. He was, by all accounts, from so many different people, a lovely, lovely person. Mrs. Webb never accepted her son died in the way that Dina said, and she quickly convinced me that I owed it to her and to her son to re-examine how Julian died. There is absolutely no way that he would have taken his own life. He was such an even sort of character, and he loved life. What had just happened to Richard made Julian's suicide look even more suspicious. At the time of his death, the coroner recorded an open verdict, but it was possible the truth was far more sinister. I suddenly thought that I was dealing with a serial killer. I decided to deal with the attempted murder of Richard Thompson, get that before a court, and then reinvestigate the death of Julian Ware. 
Police looked back at all the men right. Dina had relationships yeah, with. Need to know if you know this woman. Yeah, I do. In that case, we need to ask you a few questions about her. They were staggered by what they discovered. Once she had these men hooked, she would persuade them to let her open their mail. She would start dealing with their bank accounts. And she stole credit cards and used them without them knowing. Oh, yes, I'd like to book a flight to Miami. I'm paying by credit card. When Dina was arrested, she admitted conning money from men, but denied trying to kill Richard, claiming it was self-defense. The jury believed her story, and she was acquitted. The Black Widow had got away with it, for now. I was devastated. I was made to feel like I was the criminal. Determined to reinvestigate Julian's suspicious death, police searched for clues and even exhumed his body. Dina had always claimed that Julian overdosed on her own antidepressants, dothiapine. Tess confirmed it was the drug that killed him, but this created a new mystery. Dothiapine tastes very bitter, so you have to mask it, otherwise the person will know they're eating it. And we didn't know how that happened. Dina was questioned again, but gave away nothing. With little to go on, police knew they'd have to rely on circumstantial evidence. We went through her old statements with a fine tooth comb to find the discrepancies and show how she had lied and lied and lied. Then, a crucial lead emerged, an American friend of Julian's living in Florida. When police tracked him down, his testimony was the turning point that transformed the entire investigation. Well, she called me and told me he went fishing that day. It was his birthday. It was out in the hot sun. Yes, we think it was just too much of his heart. Drinking and took some seasickness pills, took some aspirin for his headache. Then, when she got home, she fixed him a curry. Yes, and he had a heart attack and died. She said a hot curry. I suddenly realized I had the missing piece to my jigsaw. She'd hidden the taste of the thiopin in a curry. Police now knew how Dina had killed Julian, but not why. When they re-interviewed his neighbor, they discovered the couple had been arguing over money the day he died. Yes, it's just gone. Dina had spent every last penny. As soon as Julian found out that all of their money had gone, he had to die. For Dina, it was all about the cash. By mixing a toxic cocktail of drugs into a hot vindaloo curry, his death would look like suicide, and she'd inherit everything. It would have to be a, a significant dose of dothiapine to incapacitate someone uh, and put them into a near coma state. You okay? Um, I feel, I feel like really, I feel really strange. Oh dear. <laughs> I have nightmares over how Julian's last few days went because I have visions of him being incapacitated in bed, looking at the woman he loves, continuing to overdose him until his body gave up. That's an awful, awful thought. Within 24 hours of Julian's unexpected death. Dina was at his employers asking about how to reclaim a pension and was on the phone to the mortgage company trying to redeem the mortgage. Dina subsequently invented a litany of contradictory explanations for Julian's death. He was very depressed. Bad stomach upset. He was having problems at work. And that was massively damning for me because she gave something like nine different versions. He had a very hot curry. He changed her aspirin. And then he was taking antidepressants. But the police had uncovered enough. It was time to charge her with Julian's murder. Dina denied killing Julian, but this time the jury refused to believe her. The Black Widow's tangle web of deceit had finally unraveled. The game was up. She was found guilty and sentenced to life. Quite frankly, this woman is every man's nightmare. For the last decade, she has targeted men financially, sexually and physically. And I, for one, am very glad that she's behind bars.
about truth being stranger than fiction. What a terrifying woman. Yeah, the lead detective here said she was the most dangerous woman he's ever met. I mean, the list of victims, the list of fraud convictions, I mean, it would take me too long to go through it all. It goes on for pages, but the formula she used was always the same. Tapping into their dreams, lies about cancer, that was one of her favourite ones. But all the while, getting hold of credit cards, savings, pensions, draining bank accounts, it was all totally premeditated. And by all accounts, the two husbands that we saw in your film there, you know, they, they were smart men, and yet she managed somehow to convince them. It, it was extraordinary because of the lies. They were so preposterous. I mean, when she wanted to get rid of her first husband, they owned a soft toy company, she told him that Disney wanted to buy the rights of one of their characters for £50 million. She also said that the Mafia were trying to muscle in on the deal, get the money, and were threatening their son. So she told her husband to, to change his name, go on the run till the deal was done. Astonishingly, he actually does it. He ends up living on the streets. It takes him four years to find out the truth. As soon as he's out of the picture, Dina marries Julian, even though she's already married, and then gets her claws into him. I mean, frankly, incredible. Do the police think there are any more victims? They think it's a distinct possibility. They're trawling through all of her past relationships, looking for someone who's basically vanished. There is one previous boyfriend who's classified as missing, and they're seeing if he's actually come to any harm. And what about sentencing? What does she get? Well, life with a minimum of 13 years. She did appeal, and the sentence was actually increased from 13 to 16 years. An astonishing tale. Matthew, thanks very much. Now here's Rav with a quick round-up of what's been happening on the phones. You have some great stuff already coming in from Penrith, the aggravated burglary of Mrs Bird and baby Lexi. Lots of calls coming in detailing some of the properties stolen and also the possibility of linking it with other cases, so very encouraging. Quickly, the human rights lawyer, Mr Abdul Salam. A few calls coming in already with some, hopefully, inf uh, important information there. And then to Hollyhead, the cold case murder of Mrs Doreen Morris. number of calls come in and a number of names suggested. And remember, this is a case that goes back to 1994. Good effort. That's all for now. Details of all of tonight's cases, of course, you can get online, bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. You can log on right now for live updates on what's happening right here on the phones. Here's hoping it's been busy. The lines are open until midnight tonight and from 7.30 in the morning. But don't go away because we're going to be back at 11 o'clock with a full update on all of tonight's cases. If you can help but you haven't called yet, please do it now. It could all be down to you. I'll see you at 11. Until then, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. And you can see the Crime Watch update at 11.30 here on BBC One Northern Ireland.